Imagine sitting down with a four-time Emmy-nominated television producer, Brad Holtzman, the man in charge of every single doc and reality television show at A&E. And here's what we've got coming up. Do people still watch television? Social media killed everything in in a good way, by the way, because you don't watch social media because of like format, but mostly it's the personality. Was there a certain amount of like, just make good stuff and put it out there and eventually people will find us? Create the best shows that cause five of your friends to tell you to watch those shows. What would be the five things that we should be focusing on to be better storytellers? When they choose a programming from me, they're getting more than just a passive viewing experience. They're getting something that they could talk about with their family, that they could change their kids' trajectories. Straight entertainment is not moving you forward. But if you can entertain and then give them a return on investment, that is the holy grail. Welcome to The Mark Drager Show where we dig into the stories and explore the minds of extraordinary entrepreneurs, creatives, and total badasses. Do people still watch television? They do, we just don't know when they do it. (laughs) (laughs) And who are these people? I got rid of cable in 2011, and I felt like one of the like, you know, young millennials, like I don't need cable. It was a bit of an adjustment. I don't watch live sports. So frankly, if you don't watch live sports, I feel like you don't need it. But every time we go to a cottage or we go somewhere and, and television's on, like A&E or Home and Garden Television stuff, I'm like, wow, this stuff's really good. But then I'm always reminded of the commercials. There are so many commercials. <laughs> so, there, there are so many commercials, yes. Before we jump into that, um, what is the state of television like? in 2023? It changes literally every day. I think the easy answer is the best shows will still win. And what are those best shows? They're a very small percentage. Um, They're distinct and different. Nobody wants to watch the same thing on repeat anymore outside of an older audience that still has cable. So vertical networks like HGTVs and Discovery still do very well because they have an older cable watching audience that they have brands and they have very singular and specific brands. Whereas most of what people watch are shows. They don't watch brands, they watch shows. So you've heard uh, of X show from your friend, what is the next question you ask? Oh, how do I watch it? Is it on Hulu? Is it on Prime? Is it on this? Is it on that? Um, So for me, the state of affairs is create the best shows that cause five of your friends to tell you to watch those shows. That is the state of affairs. And when that happens, everybody will make money. You will make things happen. And that's how it works. Now, that is really hard to do. It's really difficult to do. So the other side of the state of affairs is is make more of what people are already watching at a smaller price so that your return on investment of those hits and those shows that people you do know watch you can make more of. So it's producing a lot more of what people love with lesser shows. Um, And that's pretty much my model. The streamers are are a different model. I'm not a streamer. And in fact, the streamers are my clients. So my shows air on every, I have hit shows on every streamer. I work at a network that buys programming. So that's also the state of affairs. That's the brilliance. Like what, of our what, what shows are the ones where you're like, they do well? Well, I'd be curious to know which, if shows that do well on television, do well on streaming, or if they're just totally different audiences, different plays or what have you. But, but what's crushing it for you right now? Uh, what's crushing it 60 Days In has been my baby for seven, eight years now. It does really well on our network on A&E. Uh, but it really does well on Netflix. People find 60 Days In on Netflix. They think it's a Netflix show, which I'm fine. I don't care. Um, As long as they're watching shows that I help create and financially it's coming back to our company, the philosophy of our CEO is go where people are. Don't Mm. rely on where people come to us. Um, That's not the state of affairs anymore. So where do people go to watch television? Not just cable television. They go to Netflix, they go to Prime, they go to this whole world now called Fast Channels, the Tubies and the Plutos, that people in middle America, they're all free services, people are watching shows. So we have an entire Tiny House Nation channel that all it is 24-7, Tiny House Nation, you can find it on a Samsung TV. Um, So really the philosophy is 
go where people go. And when they, when that happens, everything works that they have to love the show, <laughs> but, uh, and we have to have volume of shows to make that work. But that's been our philosophy for a while now is don't just a and E is a spoke on the wheel of where you can watch our shows. Also, Mark, you started off by saying I'm a four time Emmy nomination, which I am. Yeah. Never. Were, were you hoping at, to say four time ne- Emmy winner? <laughs> no, because okay. <laughs> a Emmy has never, ever equaled viewership, never equaled money. It is a bunch of people that I'm a part of, by the way, I'm a part of the Academy. I vote every year and I love it. I love what the Academy does for so many things, but winning an Emmy is your friend acknowledging your work in the industry. It is not those two women in South Carolina talking about your program. It's not. And for me, you look at the summer blockbusters, um, yes, Oppenheimer and Barbie probably will get acknowledged by the Academy. You have to. They're so brilliant on so many levels. But most of the big growth, the movies that people watch, the television people, television series that people watch don't even get recognized critically. Um, but yet people are watching. I'd rather have more people watch and talk about my programs than people in these academies vote for me and then give me a statue. Um, you have beautiful statues behind you. I have mm-hmm. never touched an Emmy because the first time I will touch an Emmy is when I am holding that Emmy on the stage. I, I've said it. I do. I'm not deserving of touching an Emmy until it is. And for me, that's not how I, that's something that somebody else, I, I have very little control over that, but I do have control of delivering a product that hopefully people will watch. Um, on, I have on, to imagine on, that on makes level. you more employable as well. The fact that you don't have your head so far up your ass that you're busy chasing something. You're like, you know, this is a business. We got to make some money, right? Do you want to tell my uh, my company that? <laughs> Pull this clip and send it to them. I'm a third party. <laughs> it's funny because at the end of the day, I also, it's a business too, you know, and that's what's so fascinating about our industry is that um, the business is led by creatives, Mm-hmm. Generally, those are very different skill sets. And people are really good at one of them. Very rarely are people good at both. Mm-hmm. And that's been the challenge with our industry is who gets rewarded? You know, do the people that are creatives get rewarded or are the business people? And what you're seeing now is more business people are getting rewarded because at the end of the day, if you don't make money, you can't make programming. You can't make content. And for me, it's about the return. It's, you know, about spending money in the right way. It's about um, looking at the economics of our shows and going, okay, I can affect so many more people doing that versus this. Yes, this will win Emmys. Yes, this will get a critical acknowledgement. This, when you watch, you know, you feel good about yourselves because it's a great piece of programming. But if nobody's watching, did the tree really fall? You know, it, it just didn't anymore. Mm. Um, so, yeah. So I appreciate your comment, but uh, <laughs> I don't know if enough well, people understand that. I wanted to to just hit this point home, though. The fact that you got up and moved um, for other reasons or what have you, I think is remarkable. I was at a mastermind event. Uh, I was at Evan Carmichael. Uh, I was at his house in May for, for a multi-day mastermind event. And at the time, um, I think it was right when the Bud Light stuff blew up about Pride Month, you know, and they lost $27 billion or yes. something in a few days. And I'm sitting around with entrepreneurs who tend to be more conservative. Um, and they're like, how did anyone think this was a good idea? And I was saying, you know, like I come from corporate. I come from like corporate advertising. And so I have sat in meetings you know, at the head office in Toronto, which is like, I'm Canadian. So that's like our Manhattan of the country where it's like, like the people who go into advertising tend to be more creative. And the people who work in marketing departments at big corporations tend to be more creative. And we tend to have gone to creative universities or colleges or schooling. And we tend to live in our bubbles. And like, we're just so insulated by our bubbles that I remember having conversations with people where if we're talking about uh, diversity, if we're talking about inclusion, if we're talking about, um, you know, sustainability and all of these things. And it's just like a bunch of city folk who like it almost self-selects that the people making these huge decisions are within bubbles. And there was also almost this um, this elitism yeah. 
where people look down on regular people or the oh, yeah. average person or the Midwest or, and, and I'm, we've all seen this like with comedy and other things too, where it's like, well, the stuff that's funny on the coast isn't funny mid, mid, you know, mid country because it's like, they're just not smart enough to get it. And that is how <laughs> really bad decisions are made. Yeah. Because if you're making something for someone, go meet those people and spend time with them and figure out what they like and don't look down on them. And don't assume that in some kind of par uh, parental, uh, paternal way that you know better and you're going to guide moral compasses and everything. And I'm like, that is how Bud Light loses $27 billion making a stupid decision. <laughs> It, it, it totally. And, and what I would say is when you look at the industries as a whole, and I, I thought the pandemic was going to change this, and I don't know if we've found uh, the results of this yet. Um, LA and New York and San Francisco and Chicago, you know, it's so big marketing and advertising, programming, entertainment, um, throw in Miami a bit too. Really expensive places to live, really expensive places to live. So in that, that all of a sudden is a barrier of entry into the business. And then when you go into the business in a very expensive place at a young age with a very expensive living, you are making nothing in those industries. Oh, yeah. You also have to uh, intern for like, like right. I interned for six months for free. Yes. So so not only in an expensive place, but you have to figure out how to be able to survive on right. nothing, which means you're probably going to come from some money at some point, right? So that right then and there is the issue is that there is a very black and like it, it, it prevents so many people in America from getting into this business because of your basic needs. So when people rise up, you're 100 percent. The amount of people that have help from their parents or housing or whatever the case is, is, is tremendous. And I think as an industry, we need to do better about bringing so much diversity of thought, not just color of skin, not ethnicity, not religion, whatever, everything, because that's who watches entertainment. That's who markets. That's who buys products. It's every person. And when you have this small percentage, you lose perspective or you not lose. You've not had the perspective outside of maybe somebody giving you a research paper on here's what it's like to be in Topeka, Kansas. But what if somebody in Topeka, Kansas told you the real story of what it's like to be in Topeka, Kansas? How fascinating and interesting would it be? And for me, what the pandemic I thought was going to lead to was you didn't have to be anywhere at any one point. So if I'm on a Zoom call and there's, you know, 10 different states being represented because you don't have to move to LA or New York, you can live in Oklahoma. Um, now, I believe, and this is where um, I think our company remains in the forefront, we're one of the few companies that you absolutely can be 100% remote. Um, we have not changed. Most of the entertainment companies have evolved over time where now you have to spend two, three, four days in the offices. And again, where are the offices? They're in LA and New York. Our business, we don't. So I'm in Charlotte. We have people all over the country. We have, I don't think Arizona, but there are certain states that you can live in for tax reasons. And that's a whole other conversation. But most people live where they live and work where they work. And I believe that's why, and I'll say this, this is going to be the fifth straight year that we're above budget. We're doing well because I believe that bring, we are bringing America into our, um, our workforce in our in, in the brainstorms and the conversations more so than we did before the pandemic because there's more, more people have moved out of the LA and New York. This did not exist before the pandemic. People did not live all over the uh, all over America. Now they do it in our company. So again, I'm a far better executive than I was before the pandemic. Far better. Do you think this is an underappreciated, like like this this little cultural nuance of team and where you live and where you're from and how people are self selected and all like like Do you think this little thing is actually undervalued uh, or people don't realize how important this really is? Well, there's not enough years. You know, it's what did I do for my entire career? I went to an office and I was around people and we brainstormed. You didn't do that for two or three years. At the same time, the economy is hurting. Uh, inflation is going through the roof. Businesses are changing. So what are you like? Oh, it's probably because we're not here in person. That's not really the answer. <laughs> it's the answer is because you have to evolve with the times, you know, and bringing, I think, again, it's 
what's so amazing, and at least this is where I believe our bit, we can hire somebody anywhere. We can. How cool is that? That it's not just because you live 15 or you can commute to a New York City office that is unbelievably crazy expensive to do so. Even if you lived an hour out of the city, my cost of living an hour outside of the city was stupid. It was ridiculous. That's one of the another reason why we moved is I don't why am I worrying about money in New York when I don't have to worry about money somewhere else? And I'm bringing more to the job on top of that. And by the way, I'm just a flight away. Like I, my my commute is not that much longer from Charlotte into the city than it is an hour north of the city. It's, well, plus, it's you picked, plus you picked a, an airport hub, right? So well, you can fly anywhere now. <laughs> that was certainly part of the decision. But I, I don't know if it's people don't think about it. Um, I think they do. Um, but by the way, I do think people need to be in person. Um, we as a company implemented, they're called convening moments. So once a quarter as a team, we do get together. And the goal of that is to build your friendship and bondship and not to sit in a, a conference room and brainstorm because you can do that on Zoom or you can do that anywhere else. But it's, it, it is important to be in person. Absolutely. It is important enough to have a hundred percent of your team select a certain city that is very expensive. No, it's not. You know, and by the way, we can have a convening moment in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Why wouldn't we? Now we can, because it's the same cost for people to do convening components. In fact, probably much cheaper to go to Tulsa, but then you're with the people and it makes perfect sense if we want to do that anyway. So I do think that people don't think about it as much um, but I do think you have to, when you look at the the pluses and minuses, I think people do forget about the fact that there's a whole lot of plus to bringing in a, a diverse workforce that they otherwise couldn't have. My sister's an HR. She works for a company in St. Louis. She lives in Detroit. She barely goes to St. Louis. And is she any less of an executive to that St. Louis company? No, because they evolved and made it work. And if she needs to be in the office, she said, she's like, I'll go to St. Louis, not yeah. live in St. Louis, but I'll be there. And I think that's where most companies, when they revert back to the in office, it's because they haven't figured out how to the how, how the out of office. And when they look at the pressures of bringing forth a PL or an end of quarter statement, and their shareholders are like, "Oh, this is sucks." That okay, well, wh- here are all the reasons that they can say it's not working. Oh, it's probably because people aren't here in person because that's the old, very old mentality of how to work. Um, so that's the easiest to go. Oh well, the CEOs are still in LA and New York. We're just gonna, we're just gonna. I think I think it's a generational thing. You know, like I was talking to um, a, a, an older gentleman last week, who's a strategist, um, and I, I don't know what he is. He's, maybe he's in his sixties. And I've been hearing from an older generation. You know, things are changing. They're not like they used to be for like fifteen years. <laughs> And I'm so tired of hearing like things are changing. They're not like they used to be because I'm like, who still thinks that way, right? Like I've heard this from sales teams where they're like, oh, you can't do feature-based sales anymore. You got to do insight-based sales because it's you know it's not enough just to do feature and benefits. And I'm thinking, who still sells that way? And you know, this guy's a strategist, and he's like, oh, you know, people are so caught up in this. It's not like it used to be. And I'm like, dude, that was in the '80s. Like, what are you talking about? Like, who's still yeah. doing these things? We need so, to always continually evaluate. <laughs> I think it's a generational thing where people are like, you have to be in the office. And eventually there'll be a whole generation of us um, who are like, why? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. But I, I want to ask you, do you want to play a game? Of course I do. Okay. Okay. So here is the game. Mr. Beast, uh, I heard him interviewed and he talked about why he would never go onto Netflix. And he said he would never go onto Netflix, not because there's no reason to, there's no money, there's not enough of that stuff. He said the only thing that he cares about is retention rate retention rate. And he thinks that YouTubers do this better than any other um, like programming type of company. And he said, listen, go to YouTube, uh, watch the network shows. I bet you their retention rate tanks. I bet you people stop watching a minute or two in. They don't care. It's too slow. It's about, uh, and the only thing I care about is retention rate. So the game I want to play with you is based on your background, what are the four or five things we should be doing as storytellers to be able to tell better stories on YouTube, on social, wherever, it, you know, maybe we're making films. Maybe we want to get into television. You know, like I'd love to get into television. I'd love to do a series. 
I had an opportunity to pitch an executive a series and I didn't know what to pitch. <laughs> so, so what would be the five things that we should be focusing on to be better storytellers? Okay. I think the first thing is it's kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. If you cannot tell me your idea in one sentence and in that one sentence, make me interested. It's not going to be a distinct and different show. It's not going to retain people. We overcomplicate everything because we want to be different. But when you're different in a sentence, it's far more different than anything else. I could be different in a book, but what about that first paragraph that then sucks me into everything else? And if you don't have that, you're not going to read the rest of the book. How many times have you said, wait, it gets good on episode eight? Oh, gosh. Yeah, yeah. season two, they really figured it out. <laughs> yeah, by the way, no, uh-uh not happening, especially in this universe where I don't have to. There's so much content out there. I think second is um, it's be memorable. Um, and I think that is more of a reaction, but also it can be an intention. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to do a little, little off thing. Um, I'm starting my own, well, I've already started my own real estate investment company and I named it after my kids. And why did I name it after my kids? because that's what my grandfather did. My grandfather named his electrician. He was an electrician, named his company after his uh, two beautiful daughters, which one of them was my mom. Um, and I always looked up to my grandfather. So I'm like, I'm going to do the same thing. Nobody knows what that means anymore. This is 2023. How do you stick out? So I went from C&E Homes, which you don't know what C&E stands for, except I do. It's my Charlotte and Eleanor. My company is now called, <laughs> and I laugh because that's what I want the reaction to be, Dill Pickle Properties. <laughs> and that's memorable. So in a market, in a world what's of the real dealio? estate. That can be your tagline. What's the deal? I, I, I said, every deal is a big deal. Every <laughs> deal is a big deal. Um, but I also look at, again, it's the branding. It's the color. Instantly, when you think of that, you think green. What is green? It's money, you know, and that's what real estate is too. Um, when you think of a pickle, it's happiness. You know, nobody like, except for sour pickles, which we don't want to be the sour pickle. There's puns like no, crazy. It's crunchy. I like it. Yes, I like it. There's so many different types of pickles, which is so many different types of real estate. But guess what? It all starts as a cucumber, kind of boring, you know, not so exciting. And amazingly, this process turns it in from a cucumber to a beloved product. And it could be the gross, disgusting bread and butters. I know I just alienated some people, um, but it's or a kosher dill, you know, that's crunchy and uh, wonderful and amazing. It could be cold. It could be warm. It could be it, people are going crazy with it. But, okay, Brad, I have to tell you, my family, I'm Canadian. Uh, yes. My wife's family lives in Roanoke, Virginia. And when they come to Canada, they always bring back pickles with them. For some reason, apparently Canadian pickles are better than American pickles. It so, is. It maybe oh, I don't. Okay, I was gonna say I was gonna say if you haven't been to Canada, I, next time I come I did down live in September, New York for ten years, and I'm okay. from Detroit, and I'm Jewish, so oh, I will. So you got pickles covered. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of. Uh, I would come home from school and eat a jar of pickles. That was my snack. When I, I see you in September, so I gotta make a note to bring you there some you pickles. Go. There you um, go. But yeah, I think it's be memorable. Um, and that that I think you can do in any product. You can. You don't want to be the. Uh, 10th show or 15th show or 20th show you want it you want and anything you do you want to be memorable think about you know the greatest brands they're just different now did they create the industry that they're in probably not but they were just better than everybody else main, mainly because of what they were putting forth you know in in the front and then you open it up and you're like oh that's interesting that's different that's something exciting um so for me it's be memorable also it's you know i'm going to steal from everybody um, fail fast. You know, it, um, somebody told me um, a red flag never lowers. It just doesn't. So, you know, in your gut, if don't try to make something work, it will work you. And, and you just got to move on. You got to move forward. And those are, it's really hard. But if you fail fast, you'll learn quick and you'll move forward. Now, yes, Everybody will tell a story of, oh, we, we stuck with it in, in a sea of whatever. But that means you still believed in it in a way where you could beat the adversity of creating something. But if you don't have that, fail fast, move on, move forward, move on. Um, and I think in television, people just are like, mm, maybe, okay, sure. If it's not, um, oh, okay. The other one is 
if you aren't facing a room of no's, you're not doing it right. Um, oh, what does that mean? We tend, um, we tend to um, say yes by committee. It's groupthink. So the more people that are like, okay, sure, why not? Let's move forward. But if, if something doesn't cause you to think, and instantly what people do is reject. If, if you're uncomfortable, it's much easier to say no, because then you don't know the path forward versus if you're like, hell yeah, everything's amazing and great and it fails. Now, all of a sudden you have an opinion on the record. You know, meteorologists are the best at it. You know, like they, they never come back the next day and be like, oh, I told you it was going to snow and it didn't. They, they just move on. You know, they move on. Um, I think for us, it's every great idea has faced no, has faced a room of no's. Why? Because they didn't have past to kind of tell them about the future. You know, the whole, you know, Henry Ford quote, which I use so often is if you asked his people what they wanted, they would say faster horses. Right. So it took Henry Ford to say, we don't want faster horses. We want something new and different. And I think that's where that new and different. No, I want faster horses. Just do just make it better. No, be different. Still understand what people want. They want to be faster. They want to move quicker. They want to move more efficiently. But if you're not getting friction and you're not hearing the no, you know, and you really believe in and you think it's moving forward, it's hard. It's hard to succeed in this business. I think there's a lot of me mediocrity because they're not facing enough no's and no's challenge you and having understanding what that no is like, why don't you believe? And then you get it to the root of it. Same thing again, I'm going back to real estate just because it's been a big part of my world. There's no homeowner that ever was that most homeowners won't tell you, yes, of course, sell me at a low price. No, you need to understand their pain point. You need to understand their no. Why would they say no? Same thing with my CEO is why is he going to say no to what I bring forward. Um, so understand that no is okay. It's going to make you better. And if you really believe there's something and you understand, by the way, sometimes the no is you shouldn't be doing it. Certainly uh, don't reject all of the no's, but no's are, it's a really comfortable answer for people. It's a really uncomfortable thing for people to say yes, because all of a sudden you're raising, uh, you're putting your hand on that person's back and you're like, well, if it failed, all these people said yes. Well, that's a bit more uncomfortable. And those that generally say the yeses, there's not a lot of controversy behind it. Mm. Um, that's four. Keep it simple. Be memorable. Fail fast. You got to face a room of no's or you're not doing it right. What's the fifth? Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's a fifth one. I have a show coming out uh, with Anthony Anderson and Cedric the Entertainer. Um, they are starting. Uh, they have started a barbecue company. Um, and there's a whole reason why you watch it, uh, why, why you understand. Hold on, hold on. If we just look at the transcription, that is like the greatest <laughs> since ever. I'm starting a show with these two people and they have a barbecue company. Okay. Where is this yes. going? <laughs> um, right. But it's not about the barbecue company. It's about a friendship. It's about black excellence. It's about entrepreneurship. It's about two people never have started a business, you know, as actors, and they have a lot of people around them that take care of them. All of a sudden, they're entering a path of, um, of, uh, um, of unknown. So that they're failing and they're falling um, and they're figuring things out. They have to market. You know, they have to. Um, barbecue companies exist. Anthony Anderson's on television. Cedric the Entertainer. But if in that three seconds you don't attract or tell the audience why. They've turned the channel. So they have this whole marketing lesson from some of the most incredible marketers about the fact that they have fun with the three seconds and what it allowed. And, and at first it was a comedy. It was fun. But then they really realized when they hit something, you'll see it, I think, in like the third or fourth episode where they crack something in three seconds. Actually, it's the second episode. The um, Their brand promise you will never forget who these people are. So this whole three seconds really required them to think, how can I sell? It's a little bit of the keep it simple, stupid, but how can I sell my distinctiveness in three seconds when I know that I don't have a lot? Barbecue, Anthony, Cedric, there's a lot of me if you just take those strands, but together they came up with the slogan that in three seconds, you're like, tell me more, I'm in. Great. Makes me laugh. It's exactly the the response. So in television, especially in content, think about those three seconds. Also, 
you know, when you're going through Netflix, you know, and you're going through all the platforms, you're just, what is that visual? What is that title? What is that picture that goes, wait, give me another three seconds. Oh, wait, let me cause you to see a trailer. So a 30 second trailer. So what is, what are those little points? But if it's the 10th version of a flipping show that we've seen before, what's nothing is causing you to stop and hopefully pause for three seconds for that person to come check out your content. So that's number five ish. But um, I think the first three seconds is everything for an audience. I love the objectivity of it. You know, there's a certain amount of like, let's go where people are. Let's give them what they want. Let's listen to them. Um, And especially from my background, I come from this um, more, I would call it like purpose driven entrepreneurship where a lot of times, especially entrepreneurs get on their soapboxes about the way things should be and why my product is better and why my service is better and why everyone's doing it wrong. And you end up like arguing (laughs) with customers. You end up arguing with people and turning them off because you are so convinced that you have the right way to do it. And meanwhile, then we busy, we look at everyone else who's busy, like working really quickly or making a lot of money or taking off. And we're like, how come they're doing it? It's like, they're not so caught up in the philosophy of it. They're like, hey, let's go where people are. Why? Yeah. That seems unique to your channel, to your organization, to your CEO. Was there a certain amount of like, we, we have to get over our egos of owning like every aspect of the brand and just make good stuff and put it out there and eventually people will find us? I mean, so I think the only person that will really truly answer is my CEO. But <laughs> as employees, we were questioning this strategy. Um, this was at the time when Netflix was the cool place to be in work. This was... The time where the Hulus and and those places were amazing and cool. Um, But what they were doing behind the scenes were they were spending billions of dollars on infrastructure. They were spending billions of dollars of original programming costs. And people, what you found on these platforms is half the programming are old shows, are licensed shows. Um, And even when the original shows, it's not like they were cheaper and there wasn't the, the return on investment that happens on our air because it's kind of a, it's a one-stop shop. When you sell to Peacock, you're selling within the NBC universal universe. When you sell to Netflix within the Netflix universe. Um, and what we have found is A&E is a universe, but why spend all of the billions of dollars in infrastructure when you can make money by literally selling that asset to all of those platforms that need library content. So we served a place in the marketplace that people will watch 100 episodes of First 48. They will. Netflix isn't making 100 episodes of First 48 because that's not their business model. They have trained the viewer to continually come back to new programming. That's what why you subscribe every month is because what's new on Netflix? Nobody goes... What's season five of a Netflix show? Now, certain shows they like, you know, the, they want the stranger things and they want certain episodes. But for the most part, it's you, you, there's only a finite amount of that programming. When you go to, when you go to these platforms, you a lot of times go to comfort television. That's why the half hour, the Seinfelds and the friends are so valuable still to this I'm day. I'm watching Brooklyn Nine Nine again and I forgot it's, how well written that show is. <laughs> it's beautiful. You know, it's exactly so, you know, for me, um, we offer something in, in the marketplace that I think is unique. Um, the biggest answer to that, um, you once you sell, you're in that ecosystem. You know, so CBS has Paramount. Everybody has their own ecosystem. ABC has Disney Plus and Hulu. We don't have an ecosystem. Our ecosystem, yes, our, the goal is to make money when it launches on A&E. And then everything else is gravy. And then what happens is... All of these audiences are slightly different. The Netflix audience is different than the Prime audience and the Hulu audience and the Fast Channels and the Ava. All of the the places that you watch content, they're all different viewers. But what they have at the beginning of the episode is an A&E original series. So maybe that spawns somebody to come back to us. Or maybe somebody waits to when Netflix airs 60 days in again. But we offer an opportunity for both because we're trying to have the maximum value. Now our shows still need to be good. They still, Netflix isn't picking up a garbage show. So are you sure? We really, um, <laughs> All right, hold on. Maybe not from A&E, but are you sure they're, they're not picking up garbage so, shows? Um, I would say garbage show means people aren't watching it. So <laughs> okay. I, I, are you sure I, they're not? <laughs> I have flicked through some of their back catalog and I am surprised 
at how poor some of the content is. There's always an answer of why. I, okay. I, every commission, every show I've been a part of, everything, there's always a why. Sometimes the why is not, that was an amazing series. Uh, sometimes it's like, we got it done on time, uh, great budget, we made money. Yeah, well, but also in the life cycle of a series. So think about it. Um, every product in the universe probably started off in a pretty good place. It's like, I have a brilliant idea. I'm going to yeah. make that product. And then the journey of making that product can lead to greatness or it could lead to something that doesn't get production, something that doesn't get fun. It's the same thing with television is that- You know the story, sorry to interrupt. Do you know the story yeah, so of um, of the West Wing and why Aaron Sorkin and Tommy Shlami, the two co-producers kind of ended up leaving the show? Because I think it might illustrate exactly what you're talking about. Do you, do you know kind of this backstory? I don't. So, so West Wing is- uh, the, the pilot, which took the nation by storm, you know, in the late 90s, Clinton is the president. Um, and basically, Aaron Sorkin took uh, parts of, uh, I guess, a few good men or which was a play originally. He was a playwright. He took parts of all of his previous work and he stitched it together to try and sell the West Wing. You know, this one hour epic drama that's slightly funny about politics and no one would buy it. And then so in the meantime, he sold to ABC Sports Night, the half an hour comedy, which yeah. I loved, actually. That show, oh, yeah. I went to film school and started wanting to work in television because of Sports Night. And I only did it for a year and a half. And I was like, get me out of here. Amazing. <laughs> but West Wing anyway. So West Wing ends up taking off. They end up selling it. It's a massive budget, like the most highly produced, most expensive show of all time. And money was no expense because... Because Sorkin and Sh Tommy Shlami, the, the, the main director and the showrunners, just kept going back to Warner Brothers, um, who was producing the show and selling it to, I think, NBC. They kept going back and saying, like, listen, I know we're operating at a loss, but we will get Oscar or Emmys. We will get awards. We will like people will come and we will be able to sell a crazy amount of airtime. So season one is like a tight budget. Season two, they go over budget. Season three, they go over budget. But like season four... I don't know what they're at. They're like $6 million an episode. They're like way over budget, way over time. They're trying to do these bottle episodes, which to help bring the cost down. Um, but by season four, it became clear to the producers and to Warner Brothers that, that they had basically hit syndication and no more amount of money they added in would ever pay off. They have overinvested for the first four years in the show, like, you know, $100 million or something. And now they're like, now it's time to get our money back. And Aaron Sorkin and Tommy Shlami were like, no, let's keep producing the best work we can. And Warner Brothers is like, no, let's make some money now. And so they leave the show and season five, it just tanks. And it starts to get better because they run it for seven seasons. But those last three seasons were literally just all of the producers saying, how do we earn our money back? Because no dollar extra would ever lead to anything more than they had already in the first four years. And I was like, ah, oh, damn. Show business, the business side of show business, man, that's hard, isn't it? You know, it, it used to, so I, you know, there's a story. Um, I was part of Sons of Anarchy uh, back in the Were day. Were you how? Um, so my previous company, I worked at a studio called Fox 21, no longer exists. I actually don't, it's changed names so many times. Um, it's part of the Disney family now. And Sons of Anarchy was a show that we produced. Um, I was the current executive on it for a couple of seasons. And that was one of the, I could be totally wrong about this, but this is the story that I tell. This is my reality is it was one of the first Netflix licensed deals out there. And a show that was, as um, the head of the company uh, said, was a double. It was a double financially. It was a hit on FX, but financially it was a double because it cost a lot of money. And then at that time, the FX returns and license fees weren't so high. And it didn't really sell in all the ways that you can make up money in the business. We're fine. We're doubles. Netflix came in. They have this platform. They're doing well. They need inventory. They need libraries. So at a fraction of the cost uh, of an original that they don't know if it's going to perform or not, that has a limited life, they come in and say, hey, I'm going to offer you X amount of dollars per episode for your back library, your back category. At that time, I think we had four seasons or five seasons. And then in perpetuity, here's the amount of dollar that we'll pay you moving forward. Instantly, the double was a home run. So in that instance, 
Netflix made a show from a double to home run. So for net for sons of anarchy, every episode, we know that we made money. So literally the idea was how many more seasons can we get out of this series? Um, and that's truly the, the model that, um, should exist in the universe. And it doesn't anymore because everybody holds their shows within their own ecosystem. And that's where, you know, listen, I don't, I'm not intimate with the whole strike thing, you know, that's unfortunately happening with literally tens of thousands of people, but the model of people competing for episodes um, among the plat does not exist anymore. And that's partially the problem is that when you sell to NBC, you're selling to the universe. So the upside is very little, but the, the dollar amounts that everybody's making is about the same, but yet the big companies are still making a whole lot of money. Um, but there's no competition, no friends or Seinfeld deals that are really happening unless the creators own their content and creators, unfortunately, within these ecosystems aren't owning it. So um, the Sons of Anarchy story, I think it is brilliant is because, um, again, best content should win, should make a whole lot of money. And it does a little bit, but not nearly as, as much as it was. And that's, again, the uh, the writers and the, the actors and talent and everybody, um, they're trying to say like, hey, enough is enough. Um, we need to make some money too. I'm um, just like you guys are. <laughs> Somebody's got to make money. And I, I sometimes wonder if it's that there used to be stupid amount of money and people got used to stupid money and then good money seems bad compared. To I, I don't money. have the stats behind this to back this up. I don't think enough people were making stupid money. I think okay. people were making stupid money. Absolutely. Um, but just like any other organization, it's so inflated to the top, the CEOs, the C-suites. Yes, stupid amount of money. I don't think that trickled down as much as it should have um, over the course of years. And I think at the end of the day, when you have a high percentage of people that are still part of a union that are like, hey, it didn't trickle down. And the people up, up on the top of the union are like, I have stupid amount of money, so I can strike too. That's kind of the function here um, is yes. Now, I don't know if the big companies are making stupid money. You know, it's it's such an accounting trick in how things work and they're all big conglomerate companies now. Um, but yeah, it is a interesting situation to say the least, all of which I'm talking about because I'm such an interest and fan of the business. The unscripted landscape, which is what I work in 100% of the time, unchanged um, in terms of the way that the strike has helped or the strike has hurt the business or helped the business. Um, for us, it's business as usual in a very challenging time still, but yeah, um, yeah it's fascinating. Um, every well, day you wake let's up. Get into, yeah. Let's get into unscripted because I think yeah. unscripted is quite possibly the closest thing that any of us who are not setting out to do, like <laughs> become showrunners and do a 13 episode arc of something. Uh, you know, last week, uh, I was actually interviewing Leslie Patterson, who was the uh, the writer and executive producer of All Quiet on the Western Front. She won, you know, the movie, the Netflix movie won seven BAFTAs and four uh, Oscars and wow. just amazing stuff. And we dug a little bit into like writing and more kind of formal narrative. But, but you own A&E's world for what we call like, you know, the non-scripted. So like the documentary style, reality style. And that's probably the closest to what we will all do on YouTube or we will do on our social media accounts or things like that. So from where you sit, you've mentioned a few shows already, but what's kind of the formula for good television? Because when I started interning, I remember watching the executive producers and they would turn to each other at the end of the episode and they would say, that was good television. And I remember always being like, oh, I guess that's a thing. Like, hey, we just made good TV, whatever that means. So, yeah. so what is this all about? I think one, you have to be a student of this business to understand what good television is. And to be a student of the business is always, always understanding what shows are on air, who's commissioning the shows, what shows people are watching, what segment of the audience are people watching, just being an understanding of the business, both creatively and business-wise. Um, because what you need to do, just like any other industry, is create the white space opportunity. What's missing in this landscape? And you need to create the best version of that. Sometimes there's a reason why it wasn't creative. 
know, created because it's there's no need state for that type of show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I love that me, when people are like, I looked out there, I came up with this idea. No one is doing it yet. And sometimes no. I'm like, okay, do you think maybe they're like, maybe we should look at why no one is yeah. doing this yet. So there, there are a lot of answers <laughs> to the question. I will tell you my answer. My answer is um, I don't, I'm not interested in recreating the wheel. I'm interested in making it better. And I think that's, you know, there's a whole real estate side of me that will probably come out at some point. Um, and that's real estate as a whole is there's really nothing new in real estate. It's all about making it better. It's all about cyclical. It's all about being around people who are doing things better than you and loving, leveling yourself up within television, not too dissimilar. So for me, when I look at a world and, you know, 60 days in is a perfect example. This is the re this is the not recreating a wheel, but making it better. There's okay, been so 60 days in is the show where you send people to prison for 60 days. Is that right? Yeah, we send regular people who are not charged with any crime undercover into a jail for 60 days. Why? Because the jail has issues and the sheriff of the jail or whoever controls the jail wants to better their jail for inmates, for the officers, for everybody, because they firmly believe that, yes, jail should not be the Ritz-Carlton or whatever it so, is. So part undercover boss, part, uh, you know, Gordon Ramsay kitchen nightmares, smash it together and put it in a prison. A hundred percent of it's real, too. That There is not a single moment that is scripted or produced. If these people get shanked, they get shanked. If these people... Um, the, it, it, whatever happens. Um, so, so that's 60 days in. Um, so the, the core of it is a show set in an incarcerated environment. It's in jail. Um, there's been lots of shows in jail, lots of shows. Generally, there are more documentary looks at it. So from afar, we observe what happens inside jail. Generally, it's from the point of view of the staff. So those people that have careers in the jail, um, and they're like, hey, this is a jail in X city. And here's just what happens. And there's great stories and people are really love it. Um, but there's not a whole lot of it because it's hard to get access to. It's hard to produce. Um, and there's only a finite amount of uh, networks that will go after it. Um, so when this idea kind of came about, that was the flip on your head moment was one, if everybody does from the point of view of the jail, Let's do from the point of view of the inmate. Why are we doing the point of view of the inmate? One, it's different, but also that's what's relatable to a mass audience. Only a very few amount of people are going to be corrections officer, officers or sheriffs or actually work in a jail environment, but everybody watching this program could be in jail. 100%, there is not one person on this planet that is immune from that experience. So. If people like watching themselves on television or they like watching things that potentially could be themselves. And when you have it undercover, we're really meaning anybody can be on 60 Days and anybody can be on this show. So the more people that and this is the brand that I like to, to present, I want to suck my audience into the world that I'm presenting versus sitting back on a couch just observing for me. My brand of television is how can I bring more people into the world? So that was really the basis for it. Um, there's a whole lot more to it. Um, but for me, it's about people like this is the, not the recreation of the wheel. People like jail programming, but they want the Tesla. They want the cool car. Now, Teslas have four wheels. Teslas get you from A to B. Teslas aren't the lower level models, aren't the most expensive car. In fact, it's very affordable in that they're, price they're level. They're not particularly well built either. <laughs> right. So, but they do, but they flipped the entire industry on its head. The experience of somebody driving a Tesla is very different than any other experience, but they're still getting to the grocery store. You know, they're still getting places. So for me, I want to be the Tesla of television, not be the flying car that hasn't existed yet or scripted for me is the place where you can create a Game of Thrones. You can com completely create something new and crazy and different and win because people come to the fantasy world because you don't need to get sucked in from a personal level. You get sucked in because you're there for entertainment. For me, it's about how do I entertain the masses with the purpose behind it? 
you know, that, that is something that I really believe um, that television also has the purpose to uh, the has the right to do is how can I bring as many people into my world as possible and also feed them a little bit of broccoli without them thinking that it's broccoli? You know, how do I, how do I sneak that into the steak? Because um, I think that's the I, I, I love this idea of perspective. Um, you've reminded me when we used to do these big, fairly complex uh, corporate brand stories in our agency, or we do surprise and delights. You know, I can't even count the number of conversations I had with big companies who go like, we want to give something to someone. And we want them to be blown away by it. And I'd be like, okay, well, let's keep in mind the audience who's watching this is used to like home makeover where it's like, move the bus. And then everyone goes bananas. And you want to give people like, whatever, you want to give people like a Casio keyboard or something because they want to play piano one day. I'm like, I don't think they're going to start breaking down and crying. But we would always focus, I'd always try to focus the conversation on perspective. And I don't even realize how important it was until you mentioned that, I guess, because I would always say like, okay, in our own storytelling, whose perspective are we following? Is it our perspective as the company or the entrepreneur or the leader? Is it the person we're helping? Is it our team? Is it a third party, you know, sharing this, like this imaginary narrator who's out there, who's going to help bridge the gap and carry it through. And so the fact that you were just, you just simply played with perspective to be able to make sure that whomever the characters or the heroes or the main people going through the journey are more like us yeah. as viewers. Uh, what a powerful play. It's something that I don't know how many people share the philosophy of, but I believe that I can show you that the shows that have worked over time for 10, 20 years follow this model. Simply Survivor is a show that we've all thought of. What if you survived on an island? The makeup of those individuals is what's so brilliant every season, is they are a cross-section of America. You absolutely will see yourself in that cast. And that is intentional. And that is purposeful when they cast that show. So why isn't that philosophy over everybody else? Price is right. Anybody can be on that show. Literally, there's no barrier of entry. So why? Yeah, Jeopardy, why, not so much. <laughs> Jeopardy, not. But still, you know, they still, I still question, like, how did that 60 or 70 year old not be on Jeopardy 30 years earlier if they're so brilliant? You know, like, what was, because well, everybody knows about Jeopardy. But for the most part, the hits in unscripted have a relatability to it. Um, so that's either 60 days in or all my home shows, you know, I'm not really in the business of million dollar listing. That is passive viewing. Um, by the way, good television, absolutely good television. Yeah, yeah. Very well done. Yeah. I want to change people's lives. I, I think I have this, this innate I, I have this special gift. I, I get to put things on television that people watch. I'm from Michigan. I have a lot of friends that have regular jobs. And when they are finished with their regular job, what do they do? They come home and they watch TV. And how cool is it that maybe it could be one of my shows? How cool is that? And then maybe one of those shows could actually change their lives, change their perspective, give them something new. But they didn't walk into that show because of that, they watch because it's an entertaining show. It's because it's something interesting. It's something that maybe they could see themselves in. And then when they watch it, they're like, oh, wow, I didn't really realize that I could be, you know, really connected to that. Um, and one of the reasons, you know, going on a slight tangent, I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina a year ago. And one of the reasons I did was um, I've only lived in my adult life in LA and around New York City. That is not representative of America. It's not. It is. <laughs> Are you sure that all, I was just thinking about this over the weekend because I'm listening to Alexander Hamilton's biography by Ron Chernow. And we're at the point right now where they're trying to establish the uh, the federal bank and, and the divide between the northerners who are money focused and the people who are more agriculture focused. And I was like, damn, has this bubble, has this New York City bi-coastal bubble existed all the way back to like 1790? Like that's how far back we have to go. And it's always existed. It's it baked into your country, man. <laughs> it is. So here's the thing. Most of America doesn't live in those two areas or some of the bigger cities. Most of America lives outside of that. So 
listen, I, I did I specifically move to Charlotte because it was a cross session of America? No, absolutely not. But I've had more conversations about regular television shows in the last less than a year than I've had in 20 years. In fact, a month in, I'm sitting at a restaurant in South Carolina, which is just our neighbor to the north, to, to the south. And there was two women with their families. They're talking about 60 days in. Never in 20 years has that happened in my career. And I turn around, my wife goes, you're not going to. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to. So I turn, my, and I turn around. And I'm like, hey, I know we're hey, in the middle so you know, of. I make this show. <laughs> I, I, I sort of said that without being obnoxious about it. I don't think I was. And both of them were like, wait, what? And I'm like, I know. And I gave them my quick backstory. And then they just couldn't stop talking about it. And they said something in that conversation that they go, we have, we watch with our kids. And I'm like, wait, what? That show is not meant to be watched with, with kids. And I'm like, tell me, they're like, because we want to show them the realities of incarceration so that if ever there's a moment of whether they're going to do something or not, the last place they ever want to know is that the result of their action is going to that environment. And they talk through the episodes like that. Never in ever would I've had that conversation in New York and LA. And I had this in the middle of South Carolina with two very lovely women. And for me, that's what it's about. It's not about me. It's not about what I want. And when you're in LA and New York, there's a very I mentality. It's about how can I present programming that people want to watch? At the end of the day, I'm not making television for myself. As much as I, if I want to produce a film or a documentary or something that I have to bring out into the world and I have millions of dollars I want to waste, absolutely, you can do whatever you want. But for me, I have this gift of how can I bring somewhat, it's not issues based, but talk about what people are or not talking about in a very entertaining way so that when they're at their house, their dinner, or when they're choosing and going through all of the choices, when they choose a programming from me, they're getting more than just a passive viewing experience. They're getting something that they could talk about with their family, that they could change their kids' trajectories potentially, but without, again, without doing it in a preachy way. No, that it's very difficult to be a parent because your kid knows it's like, I'm your, I'm teaching you. Um, but the best teachers on this planet do it in a way where you're not being taught. Um, and it's experiential. And I think that's what television allows for um, outside. And that's what I love doing. Um, and I've had a success. I've had lots of failures doing it. Um, but always the goal <laughs> is that is to affect a lot of lives. I love that lesson that you just shared with us. You know, the idea of leaving the bubble, of leaving, you know, the New Yorks and the LAs to get into middle America, because I mean, this is who you're making your product, your stories for. When you're looking at a concept or a show, are you balancing out like, okay, um, you know, our concept is pretty standard and plain, but but the character of our host is going to be carrying it. So so we don't have to over-engineer this side because we know we can count on our the character of our host. Or if the host is a little bit this way, do you look for something like, are there like four or five different levers you have to pull? And as long as you know that you're going all in on something, you don't have to worry about the other stuff. Or are you trying to line up a win across the board? All right. So I'm going to tell you what most people think. And then what I think when you first said is that's okay about, you know, the show, but I have amazing talent. Great. Fantastic. That will sustain you for about a season. But if there's not a format or something behind it that's driving this great talent, then people will have been there, seen it, done it. So when you look at all of the big shows on television, almost none of them had talent at the forefront. They had a format. Now, the talent may have gotten up and up, but it was all about the format. When you look at Survivor, when you look at Big Brother, Amazing Race, you look at The Voice, the format, you look at American Idol, you look at the biggest unscripted shows on television, format. When you look at shows that in the first couple seasons shine bright, you probably not have heard of anymore if they didn't have the format behind it. So it's hand in hand. And I think it's got to be organic. So here's what I will say. Great talent will give you great format, will then lift up the talent. So I think it's one of the same. So if I have talent that's doing something distinct and different, I can formulate a format that is better almost than what the talent's delivering. And then I've now given the better version of that format for that talent that's already playing in that world even better. But if it's 
great talent and it's like another show you've seen before, it will not last. Nobody is coming to a show past a first season or past even a first couple episodes because the talent, here's why. Social media killed everything in, in a good way, by the way, because it made the, the what social media does. You don't watch social media because of the con or the format per se. Some of them, some of the feeds you do, but mostly it's the personality. Think about, you know, TikTok and YouTube are really personality driven. Yes, they have a format behind them, Mr. Beast being the best one, but you're watching for Mr. Beast. And yes, he's cracked a format, you know, but he could evolve. He doesn't have to have the format every time. You know, it's you're coming for him. In our world, it's the opposite. Um, it really has to be the format that, that really sells and, and moves forward. And when and that's the sentence, because nobody's going to say in the sentence or the three seconds, Bob Jones, it's going to be the format. It's you can flip a house in this or you're in this city or did you realize like, the no money down or my, you can live in a free house. Like what are those things that just attract you immediately? And then now I have amazing talent that format was built on. Then the talent comes in. Oh, and here's a person who is doing that. Um, Ooh, so okay. I think mo most of this industry think talent rules all talent. And here's the truth. It's because talent's really good at whining and dining people. They're really good at like having a nice steak dinner with somebody and being like, oh, I got to be in business with this person. How cool is it? We all do it. I do it. I was like, oh my God, I had this most amazing meal with this person, the great social event. I want to be in business with this person. But then you unpack it and you're like, I don't know what the show is. I don't know how mm. distinct and different it is. Mm. And we've got to have that level um, of understanding. And, and that's why I think I love talent is because I have that great meal, but I challenge them. I'm like, okay. Here's the reality. You do what everybody else does, and that's great for your business. Television, different world. So let's unpack. You know, what's something that do you want to be doing? What's something that if you had to say you do better than everybody else, what is that? Let's break it down from the, the you know, from the big broadness to what's this thing. And then let's grow. And it doesn't have to be very big. My talent in uh, the polites, Dedrick and Crystal, they flip homes. With the renovation budgets under fifty thousand dollars in under fifty days, there's a whole reason behind it. That's to keep it simple. But that was created by them. But the format is what drives you to the show. And then once you're in the format, you're like, "Oh, I love Dedrick and Crystal. They're amazing people." But it's that first. It's the format versus talent. This is oh, okay. Thank you. You've hit on something that that I need to get better at. That I think we all do. And I've often thought, you know, like, like even this show, we went through a name change uh, a little while ago because it just wasn't feeling right. Part of it was that Christmas, we had this opportunity to pitch. Um, we had this opportunity to pitch for programming. And I was kind of like to my team, like, I don't know what the pitch is. And that felt broken to me. Like it, it should just be, hey, take this thing we're doing and let's do it yes. bigger. Let's do it better. Let's go out into the world. And yet I realized like there was not, there was no, there's no format and it felt weird to me. And everyone's like, oh, you don't need that because people will come for, you know, like eventually people will listen and this, and I'm like, ah, but I, I think we need like a structure. I think we need a, like exactly what you're talking about. And so the next thing I bump up against is like, well, how big does something have to be in order to put the time and effort into the format? But, but what I'm going to take away from this conversation more than anything else is these lessons you've shared of keeping it simple, of making sure that you can pitch it in a single sentence and that you should have a format. And whether you're launching an email newsletter or whether you're launching a new YouTube channel or you're trying to pitch for a TV show, uh, focus on that format because your personality will get boring or annoying eventually, right? Like people will have enough of it. <laughs> Think about, um, you know, at least in, in the real estate, not in real estate, but in the business world, Cody Sanchez, um, she buys businesses. Um, successful businesses um, in a way uh, similar to flipping homes. Um, and she does in the business world, but her newsletter is called Contrarian Thinking. You don't know who Cody is, but when you see that subject, Contrarian thing, oh, interesting. So somebody's looking at things differently right then and there. And then you get sucked into this newsletter and they're like, oh, there's a face behind it. Her name's Cody Sanchez. She has skyrocketed in the last year because she brought something distinct and different to the table that people have been doing for 50 years. Like the, buying business is not new. You know, what she's doing is not new, but her way about thinking about it was in the same world. But if she launched, and by the way, she's a good talent, but it was like, I'm Cody and I'm the best talent and I do this. 
nobody would pay attention. But the fact that she brought something different to the table is everything. Oh man, I, I want to follow up with you in a few months, uh, and like personally, we'll follow up because we're launching a new podcast in my agency sales loop. And my team pushed me to make it as simple as possible, which makes me so uncomfortable. So we're launching this podcast, How to Sell More. And guess what the format is? Every episode is a single topic on what you can do in some way to sell more. And that's it. And it's and like, the episode it's so, title is that going to be the subject of what do you sell more, right? Uh, yes. In. And so yes. this can be on any aspect from profitability, like anything you do within a business that will help you increase revenue, or increase profits. Now, I don't want to get into financials. I don't want to get into operations. That stuff's boring to me. But 20 to 30 minutes, interview-based or lecture-based, two episodes per week, literally it's how to sell more. And that's it. And I was so um, against how simple it was. And then yeah. now that we're a few weeks in and we're in pre-production and the guests get it and it's easy to explain and the bookings are going through the roof and I'm realizing, hey, we can take each interview and create chapters and create a chapter book. Like, like now that I've embraced how direct it is. I'm like, this is the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> I so, love how simple it is. <laughs> when you talked about the five things, here's the, the return on investment. Um, people have are so busy. There's so much distraction that if somebody feels like they're getting something more about doing or viewing or listening to this, they will be with it on repeat. So what you're providing is exactly that. You're, there's a problem people have, how do you sell more? And you're providing that playbook. So it doesn't matter who you are or what you are, but obviously you raise that bar to the level because of how good you are, but it's really the subject matter and the return. So when I look at my shows too, from, you know, I also produce intervention, interventions about drug addicts, you know, on death's door that hopefully through this experience that they don't know that's yet coming, they're going to turn a literally from death to sober, sob sobriety. And what it allows for an audience to go, wait, if I'm in that situation, which unfortunately way too many people in the world are, they can come to our show and get a playbook or an understanding. There's a return on the investment. It's not just entertainment. Straight entertainment is not moving you forward. But if you can entertain and then give them a return on investment, that is the holy grail. That is everything, no matter what world you exist. And you're doing that in selling. That's exactly when I hear that. I'm like, yes, don't just give me the same thing on repeat. What you're giving me is I have a problem. You're coming up with solutions and you're being very targeted. Now, am I going to listen to every one of your podcasts? At first, probably not because I'm going to identify. But then once I'm in there, I'm going to go back. And I'm going to go and I'm going to be like, oh, what don't I know? Um, so I think that's very smart. And also what that provides is longevity. You know, that somebody can listen to that podcast five years. We do that in television. There's nothing better than I have episodes of um, of my series that are 10 years, 15 years old. And it doesn't feel dated because we really purposely thought what are evergreen? What's something that unfortunately, like I would love intervention not to be a relevant series. Love it. I would love 60 days in not to be a relevant series. I would love it. The unfortunate truth is it's not. So people keep coming back to these stories, they're evergreen topics, and thus they have a longevity to it. And then the business comes with all of that. <laughs> Brad Holzman. Oh man, thank you so much for your time. This has been, I love these conversations where I'm like, I'm not quite sure where it's going to go, but you have given me a glimpse. Uh, you've given us a glimpse into this window, into this entire world where frankly, most of us just kind of think how things work from t other TV shows or other things we're doing. So thank you. Thank you. Now, if people wanted to follow up with you directly, if they wanted to learn more about what you're doing, where would be the best place for them to go? All right. So here's about being memorable. Um, I, my Instagram is the best way to get a hold of me. It's I Brad. Gonna say LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> and Brad. No. Um, Instagram. Uh, it's a, a touch into <laughs> the many hats that I wear in life. Um, many passions. Um, it is Brad needs abs. Are you working on those abs? I have taken a hiatus uh, from working on the abs, uh, which is unfortunate because that is going to be um, that literally I'm rewriting my morning routine. Um, and I did that. I started that yesterday um, and I haven't included exercise into that. Um, so I have 
my workout plan for the next three months. Um, oh, brilliant. So we're getting back into it. But the, my content was uh, a lot of fitness because I had found fitness after 40. Um, and it was pretty relatable to, unfortunately, way too many men and women because uh, I had never been fitness. Um, and then it's evolved into um, everything else that I do. But um, I answer all my DMs. I don't have, um, I have a, uh, it's very, it's a very fun, but that's the best way to get a hold of me on any, uh, for anything whatsoever. Amazing. Final question for you. 30 seconds or less. What does it all come down to at the end of the day? Bringing smile to as many people as you can. 